Dnipropetrovsk, known simply as Dnipro by those who live here, is the third largest city in Ukraine, about 400 kilometers southeast of the capital, Kiev. Our one square mile is in the middle of the country's industrial heartlands, on the south bank of the vast Dnipro River. It played a key role in the arms, space and nuclear programs of the former USSR, but is now emerging from its Soviet shadow. Places like this, temples of shopping dedicated to consumer culture, really illustrate how much this country's changed over the past 20 years. In Soviet times, shelves were often bare and there was nothing to buy. Now there's everything to buy, everything's available, but few people who can afford it. It's a public holiday today, so Most City, the biggest shopping centre in Dnipro, is teeming with people. Drawn in by the high-end labels and the glitz, for many it's a family outing. After all, it costs nothing to look. Is the gap between rich and poor here widening, do you think? Tell me, what's the flower for? And what's it like being a woman in Dnipro today? It's the 100th anniversary of International Women's Day and what that means here is that Ukrainian women are given flowers and presents by the men they know and not just husbands and boyfriends but brothers, bosses, employees and unlike in some countries this isn't a day to raise questions about equality or women's rights it's a day to revere femininity and to celebrate what every Ukrainian I've spoken to here has said to me man and woman that Ukrainian women are simply the most beautiful in the world <laughs> It's estimated that over half all Ukrainians work in sales, so I'm going to meet someone who does just that. In fact, he's a salesman by day and he's a musician by night. It's Denis Davidov. Hi, Denis. Nice to meet you. Hello. Nice to meet you. Tell me first, because I'm very intrigued, what is going on here? <laughs> those are the locks that those people who are in love, they just put it here and it's like in the memory of their eternal love. They just put their names on a date and they just throw away the key. Talking of love, I know you love this city and you've traveled the world, but you've come back here. Why is that? What's so great about it? First of all, I was born here and um, I know the history very good and I just enjoy being here, walking down the promenade with my friends. I can feel the spirit of the city in some way. It's I, under your skin, is it? Yep, I see it in my dreams very often and I don't know, it's just very special for me. Okay, well let's kind of look at the embankments that I've heard so much about. Dnipro is famous throughout Ukraine for having the longest embankment in Europe, a whopping 23 kilometers. Some claim it's the longest in the world. With an icy March wind whistling off the water, I find it quite hard to imagine the scene here on warm days and balmy evenings, when people gather to meet friends and stroll along the river. Today, only the hardiest of fishermen are braving the near freezing temperatures. So this is one of your favorite bits then is it? Our one square mile is a place of contrasts. Winter temperatures here can plummet to minus 15 while in summer the city swelters in up to 30 degrees. And what are we seeing around here then? What, what Point me out the landmarks of Dnipro from here. Well, first of all you can see the river. This bridge is the widest in Ukraine I guess, the longest. Yep, this is the church. It's just a monastery island and it used to be an ancient monastery in 
13th century, I guess. And you can see that building over there. Yeah. It's uh, it's like a sale of Dnipro. It's an abandoned hotel. It was never complete. They started it as a communism regime and they wanted it to be the fancy hotel for all the delegations from other parts of the world. But yeah, now it's 97% complete and it's just not used. So really it's just the legacy of, of the Soviet Union? Pretty much. That's the monument to the old empire that was one day they came to its end. Behind these gates is one of the sites which made Dnipro a closed city for so many years during Soviet times. As a major producer of space technology and ballistic missiles, it was considered far too sensitive for any potential foreign spies to get anywhere near. And I have to say, it's not exactly been easy getting permission to go in there today. At its height during the Cold War years, Yuzmash employed 55,000 people and was a linchpin of the Soviet intercontinental ballistic missile and space programs. Before venturing inside, I had a look around outside at two of the factory's proudest achievements. The first rocket ever produced here, and right opposite it, the most deadly. SS-18, the most powerful missile in the world. The Satana carries 10 warheads and has a range of over 10,000 kilometers. It was commissioned by the Soviets and is almost 30 years old. An updated version is still being produced today. Well, we're finally here. It took a while to get in. Lots of security, lots of passport showing and signing of things. Um, obviously still very sensitive, but we're finally inside. Wow, look. It's a proper rocket taking place over there. Sorry, we're not allowed to film here. Okay. I've come to meet Viktor Shahogol, the Director General, and Head of Design Oleksandr Diegtyaryov, who've both worked here for almost 40 years. These days, Yuzmash builds rockets and missiles for countries all over the world, including their old Cold War adversary, the United States. But old habits die hard. So that's American. It's American, but it's not it's yet allowed to, <laughs> to <laughs> do a picture. Oh, not allowed it's to do a picture? Not, uh, not allowed yet. It's oh, right. Uh, the workers at Yuzhmash are proud, not of how their missiles enabled them to wage war, but of how they helped keep the peace. This place was uh, very important for former Soviet Union because our responsibility was create base uh, uh, for uh, nuclear shield you know that it was a time of uh, cold war and it was very important to have a balance between uh, main main countries in the world <laughs> i mean there's a great irony there isn't isn't there that here this top secret soviet plant is <laughs> now working you know that uh, with the americans it's, sometimes it's a uh, it's uh, looking like very strange that mirror is uh, changing in a very short period and it's one of the very great achievements of this period and uh, uh, achievement that because our city is not <laughs> top secret now it's, uh, it's good it's a good sign and they're optimistic about the future after having to institute a three-day week they're now back to working five days have over 20 foreign clients and orders totaling $900 million on their books. Which may sound like a lot, but of course in this high-tech, high-spec world, you don't get many bangs for your buck. In part two, I'll be meeting the Jewish community, who are building a huge new cultural center. And the woman who rose from Dnipro factory worker to prime minister. <laughs>